Welcome everyone to the University of New Mexico Law and Mental Health Series, weekly discussions of practice and science featuring experts in behavioral health and the law. This is a series run by the Division of Forensic Behavioral Sciences of the University of New Mexico's Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences in support with the New Mexico Behavioral Health Services Division. I'm Anthony Perillo, the Forensic Psychology Training Director here at the University of New Mexico. For our talk today, if you have any questions for our presenters, make sure you enter them in the Q&A box. You can enter those anytime you feel comfortable, but do know that we hold them to the end. And oftentimes we have more questions than we have time for, so just forgive us if we can't get to yours. If you are pursuing continuing medical education credits, there will be a sign-in sheet posted in the chat box shortly. Keep your eye on the chat box if you're also pursuing APA continuing education credits, but know that the link for that will be in the last latter portions of the presentation. Uh, there will be a link for a survey for you to complete. Make sure that you can bookmark that if you're not opening it up right now. And make sure you save your certificate after you complete the survey because we don't have access to those after the fact. If you missed last week's talk in the series, Dr. Bill Frankenstein's dive into assessing substance use allegations and high conflict family court cases is now available on our YouTube channel. The recording for this week's talk should also be available on our YouTube page later this week, and the PowerPoint slides will be accessible for people registered for the series later this week as well. As a heads, week, heads up for next week's talk in the series, we'll have Dr. Anna Feynman, who will be discussing psycholegal considerations around the incel movement. But let's get back to this week. Uh, I'm honored and excited to introduce you to today's speaker who will be discussing identification of survivors of child commercial sex, sexual exploitation. This is Dr. James Andretta. Dr. James Andretta is a board-certified forensic psychologist who develops adolescent and adult forensic mental health assessments in the Portland, Oregon area through Bridgetown Psychological. In addition to his clinical work, uh, James has published over 50 manuscripts and co-edited a 2019 special issue of Behavioral Sciences and the Law with senior editor Christopher Sullivan on the use of statistics in criminal cases. Last year, he was named a fellow of the American Academy of Assessment Psychology and also received the Social Justice Leader Award, an honor presented by the Human Trafficking and Social Justice Institute at the University of Toledo. Uh, James has also served on the American Psychology Law Society's Committee on Broadening Representation, Inclusion, Diversity, and Global Equity. This is where I've had the pleasure of meeting him, uh, and is also on the Teaching, Training, and Careers Committee. As if he wasn't contributing enough, he is also a current member of APLS's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Task Force since 2022. So Dr. Andretta James, uh, on behalf of the, Un the University of New Mexico, uh, it's a thrill to have you joining the series, uh, and we're thankful for having you sharing your expertise with us today. I'll uh, go ahead and throw it over to you. Thank you so much. I'm very honored by the introduction and honored to, to be here today. Um, thank you uh, so much. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, so today I'm going to be talking about um, uh, the identification of uh, survivors of the commercial sexual exploitation of, of children. Oops, sorry. I'm going to move through these, sorry. Um, and just to begin that, you know, my, my opinions aren't necessarily shared by, by the University of New Mexico. Um, you're going to be hearing CSEC a lot today. Um, and as Anthony pointed out, that stands for the commercial sexual exploitation of children. Um, some folks say human trafficking or sex trafficking. Um, and those words, I think, work fine. But for me, they're less uh, socially, they're, they're a little more socially complicated than, than CSEC, kind of in the way that, um, you know, homeless is, is a complicated word and houseless or unhoused is, is not. Um, so my objectives today is to first begin by uh, describing recent developments in law and practice um, to address CSEC in the United States, to also describe um, extant efforts to identify, to identify CSEC survivors and those who are at risk of CSEC. Um, and then my third objective is to discuss some improvements that we can make on the identification of uh, victims and or survivors and uh, those who are who are at risk. Um, beginning with some cultural stuff, uh, my name is James. I identify as male and I use he and him pronouns. Um, if if folks uh, chime in, feel free to please uh, make make that clear as well, so that we don't have um, awkward or inappropriate moments. Thank you. Um, I also just want to uh, accept that you know I'm a white heterosexual male. I grew up in a middle upper middle class family, uh, went to private schools. I don't think you can do that process without coming out 
um, you know, with with some some prob problematic uh, imperfections. And I, I choose to acknowledge those as a way to stay on my toes to monitor and improve my behavior, just realizing that, you know, I'm really not an exception to uh, the way society um, uh, forms forms all of us sometimes in very problematic ways. So if I say something that makes you feel uncomfortable or is inappropriate, uh, please let me know. I'm always looking uh, for, for ways to self-reflect on how my behavior is affecting other people. Um, another cultural consideration, um, just like a lot of uh, other things um, in this country um, that are adverse, they disproportionately fall on the backs on folks who are already marginalized. Um, and so we just want to be careful around some of the, the language we use when we're talking about uh, CSEC survivors. Um, in terms of kind of a working definition of uh, CSEC, um, basically, um, anytime uh, children, sex, and economies uh, intersect. Um, we're talking about uh, we're talking about CSEC probably in some way. Um, in terms of the the prevalence of this problem in this country, we really just don't know. Um, unfortunately, part of the issue is that a lot of CSEC survivors aren't even sure they're being trafficked themselves. Um, for example, some folks think they're just doing um, favors for a, a partner of theirs. Um, another uh, obstacle to data collection on prevalence is that survivors who are aware <clears throat> of their uh, status um, are reluctant to disclose, and we just simply do not have kind of working, developing, reliable databases at this time. Some data points we do have is that National Center uh, for Missing and Exploited Children estimates that it, you know, about one in six of their cases uh, involves an individual who's likely a CSEC victim. Um, I, will, I will say that I, I don't know how they established um, likely, unfortunately. Um, Illinois has released um, statistics um, and, uh, you know, they identify that about 419 uh, children in their state um, between 2011 and 2015 were um, identified survivor CSEC. Keep in mind, there's three, about 3 million children in Illinois during that time. Um, and so, uh, you know, th those numbers are, are pretty low and, it, and it's hard to get those, those numbers. That's a data point. Crude estimates are at about you know, in a country that has, you know, over 70 million children. Um, and those crude estimates were from everything from interviews, qualitative interviews with uh, people in social service agencies to um, actual um, hard data um, being collected. Um, and then, of course, there's the approach of um, tracking arrest rates. Of course, we've moved to decriminalize survivors of, of CSEC, um, but that actually hasn't been until very recently, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But of course, you know, arrest rates, if you're going by arrest rates, uh, the rate of CSEC uh, survivorship in the country is very low. Okay, so here's our, our first goal to start talking a little bit about um, developments in law and practice uh, to address CSEC in the United States. Um, there have been uh, a few um, sort of legal contributions um, to starting to address CSEC in the country, dating back to about 1910, the Mann Act. But the first sort of comprehensive um, legislation was this Trafficking Victims Protection Act. Um, and it, you know, referred to as the three Ps framework uh, protections. Protections, the protection part really just kind of expanded protections that were already afforded to U.S., um, based children to folks who were um, immigrating. In terms of prevention, there were offices and task force being established through this act to address um, CSEC. Um, and in terms of prosecution, uh, prosecutors were being, were being given tools to prosecute um, traffickers and um, courts were be giving, were um, allotted tools for, for adjudicating um, traffickers in various ways. Um, a series of reauthorizations 
um, occurred. Um, a very large one occurred in 2003, which again began with um, expanding tools for prosecutors to prosecute traffickers, um, adding civil remedies for uh, civil litigation against traffickers. Uh, but it also established uh, this operating group, um, which was allowed to have, uh, was, was, which allotted uh, grants. Um, and it also required the attorney general to, or mandated the attorney general to uh, develop an annual report on human trafficking. So here, here are, here's the series of uh, recent reauthorizations of that act. I'm not gonna go through um, all of them. Um, I will say that the reauthorization in 2017 is particularly relevant to our uh, the talk today because it required the attorney general to issue uh, a human trafficking victim screening protocol. <laughs> if, if anyone knows where that is, let me know. <laughs> because I can't find it, but hopefully it, it, it comes out. Um, it also um, required um, reports to be um, submitted to, to Congress. And so let's, oh, okay, I'll, I'll do one more national level law actually before we start getting more narrowed into uh, what states are doing and then um, how I became involved. So in 2014, President Obama helped push through um, this, um, this legislation. And uh, basically it charged state agencies with identifying CSEC victims and providing them with appropriate uh, services. So moving to kind of the more of the, the narrowed um, state level, in Washington, D.C. in 2010, the D.C. government passed um, a law which required um, agencies who engage in behavioral health screening. And so that would be, you know, uh, poor, uh, sorry, Washington, D.C. public schools, um, you know, uh, the Department of Child Protective Services um, and other agencies like that, and D.C. courts, um, from, it, it charged them with identifying uh, survivors of CSEC and identifying those who are at risk for CSEC. And I actually, it, it's interesting that this, this uh, law was passed in 2010 because believe it or not, um, being, you know, a CSEC, being a CSEC survivor wasn't decriminalized in Washington, D.C. until 2018. But I can tell you, I arrived to D.C. courts uh, for a postdoctoral fellowship in forensic psychology in February of 2012. And at that time, um, it, it was well known that police were um, simply giving masking charges uh, for folks, for um, children and adolescents who they believed were um, survivors of, of CSEC, you know, so it would be a charge of things like loitering. And in fact, um, and we'll get to this, um, when we uh, developed a screening tool for CSEC risk at DC courts, we included masking charges as one of the risk factors because we knew that was um, a practice of police on the streets. Um, okay, so moving now to talking about efforts to uh, identify uh, victims of, of uh, victims survivors of, of CSEC. Um, so in Washington, D.C., that legislation passed in 2010, undoubtedly um, in part because of the federal mandates that were um, coming down. I arrived to my postdoc, as I said, in February of 2012, and I was excited to be um, getting ready to do my clinical work, but also to do research on racial identity attitudes and stereotype threat and all these other types of constructs with um, my supervisor, Dr. Malcolm Woodland in DC. And he called me into his office on my, I don't, third or fourth day. And he said, did you know that we have a child sex trafficking problem in DC? And I said, no. <laughs> and I was, I was, a, it was a wake up moment for me that I had gone through graduate school, that I had, um, you know, been involved in working with children and adolescents for so long. And this issue really had never been on my radar. But he said, he said to me, yeah, it's a, it's a big problem. And in fact, did you know that the DC uh, legislature passed a law that all the agencies, including us, um, have to screen all the kids who come through our system to see if they are at risk for being um, trafficked. 
And I said, no. And he said, yeah. And actually they wrote in the law that I mentioned before that there's a screening tool. And I said, oh, that's great, Dr. Wood. Where is it? We'll start using it here at the courts because at the time during my uh, stock, I was charged with, um, along with my, um, my colleague, Dr. Aaron Ramirez, our job was to sit at intake at DC courts and give a, do a mental health screen of every kid who was arrested um, in the city. Um, and that was about 3,000 a year. And I said, great, give me the protocol and, and we'll, we'll start using it. And he said, ah, <laughs> that's the problem. There's no protocol. So we had to set forth on um, developing a protocol for, um, for screening for a CSEC um, in DC to come into legal compliance. And it, you know, it's really a shame that it took um, legal compliance uh, to get us to move. Because if I'm being honest with myself, I probably would have floated all the way through that uh, postdoctoral fellowship without this issue even being um, really on my, my radar, which is embarrassing, but uh, comes from a place of, of honesty. So in terms of the demographics of the folks we were um, screening, um, yep, we got about three arrest, three thousand arrests a year. Um, from some of the research that we were developing, we knew that about half the males and about sixty-three percent of the females likely suffered from a mental health uh, disorder, and that was established during those mental health screenings I was talking about. We um, employed the Connors Comprehensive Behavior Rating Scales um, and used, um, you know, uh, T scores to um, estimate, you know probabilities of being an individual with a with a mental um, with a mental illness we established um, you know the structural validity and the reliability of those scores in this population um, specifically one of the major uh, obstacles that we were um, that was put on our radar when we began to think about what questions to generate for children to get at their risk for CSEC uh, victimization or risk was that um, stakeholders in the area were telling us, um, you know, you can't ask them if they're survivors because one, police are already asking them if they're survivors. When they get to, to juvenile detention, um, even if it's just for a short period, they're probably being asked again. And all these questions are, are can be pretty traumatizing. So you've got to figure out a way to ask them without asking them. Um, and so that's what we set, set forth um, to do. At the time, there were already two, a, well, one published, the Intersect, and one unpublished, the Intervene, screening protocols to um, assess risk for um, CSEC uh, victimization, survivorship. Um, and these are, these are great protocols for anyone who um, is is interested in implementing this at, at their agency. They're great. Um, they, they include a lot of open-end questions. They are sort of multiple stage um, interviews. And, and the, the stages go from less intrusive to more intrusive to more intrusive. And it's kind of like you know triage. So not every child goes through all the different stages, only the folks at the high, highest level of risk. And then at the end, there's this subjective, um, qualitative, um, decision-making system on whether or not this person should be um, recommended or referred for um, intervention. I recommend the, inter the intervene and the intersect. Um, the information that we got from, from their studies was that um, items to think about in terms of when you're sitting down to, to, to ask a child questions to get some get some insight into their level of risk or, you know, do they have an inappropriately older boyfriend or partner? Um, is there a tattoo that is suggestive of branding? Uh, do they have items that they didn't buy that seem very expensive and might not be in keeping um, with something that someone that age would have? Um, also, hey, the frequency and duration of runaways, um, a history of court contact, like we were talking about before, um, there might be a laundry list of what we call masking charges, like loitering and um, things like that. And then, of course, um, the, uh, the observation of, of bruises, which is um, an indicator of, of, of abuse, of course, more broadly. So those tools that were out there weren't going to work for us in D.C., and it 
comes back to the 3,000 kids arrested each year. There simply was not any way we could have implemented those protocols um, in, into, our, uh, into our sort of administrative dem daily demands um, at DC courts. So what we set out to develop was um, something that would be brief, objective, and non-intrusive, meaning that we weren't gonna, we were gonna try not to ask questions that would be um, triggering. And I think the one that we really just kept away from is the one we talked about before, where stakeholders were telling us, were asking us, you know, please don't ask them to disclose um, during this interview. <clears throat> we thought, okay, so what we'll do is we'll develop an index of risk and we'll refer out to, um, to agencies and those agencies will handle um, disclosure. Um, okay, so we, so we wanted to be quantitative and we set up um, an, an ordinal scale. We gathered items using some of the information we got from Intersect and their intervene. I also developed a literature review and, and developed um, items that we moved forward with uh, piloting. And what would, how this process would happen is an interviewer, um, which was me or my colleague, would sit at intake and we would we would ask, you know, where were you staying overnight prior to detention? And then based on their response, we'd give it a score of zero, one, or two based on the, the level of risk we believe their response to that item um, indicated. Uh, we piloted our, our um, items um, in 900, 900 youth. Um, the average age was 15. I can tell you we did much larger scale studies when I was at DC course in the, the average age was always 15, 16, right in that range. So this was, this was accurate. Um, we had about um, half of our um, interviews were, were with males. 95% um, of the population was African-American, which was in keeping um, with all of our other um, studies. Okay. Um, and so as we were getting into the process, what we realized was that we had to have um, a code book and the code book had to get, you know, sequentially more nuanced for us to have um, accurate scores. And we also wanted to keep up with inter-rater reliability. So this is just an example of, a, of, a, of an item in our, in our code book. Um, to help the um, clinician doing the interview come to the same score other clinicians uh, would come to so that we would have inter-rater reliability. Um, and so we, we actually started uh, examining inter-rater reliability in, in mock interviews, and then we did actual cases and we checked inter-rater reliability at one, two, eight, nine, and 10 months and at a year. Um, and it was always really high, uh, but it was, it, was, um, it was an undertaking, which I'll get to. Um, in a little bit. Um, and so to examine um, how well our items were, were working, we employed um, an item response theory model. Um, and we decided not to go with um, you know, classical test theory because looking at our items, there really wasn't any reason to assume there would be internal consistency or that alpha you're looking for right on a, on a typical scale. Um, the only explanatory, the, the only sort of um, grouping explanatory factor in the scores, right, should be the level of risk. And whether or not someone endorses an item has to do with the probabilistic relationship of the response given their level of CSEC risk. So picture a math test, right? You wouldn't have internal consistency um, in, in a math test. It's just, you know, if someone's at a certain level of math ability, they're gonna get a certain amount right and a certain amount um, wrong, um, if, if that makes sense. Okay. So again, yeah, item response theory, just examining the probabilistic relationship between responses to items and the latent trait, which is risk. Uh, we, uh, so as I was uh, developing the IRT, I could, I, it seemed as though we were getting the most information at about one standard deviation above the mean. Um, and so I cut, I did critical cuts. I did kind of a triage of 
low, moderate, and high risk at one, two, and three standard deviations um, above the mean, and um, looked at what our sort of raw cutoff scores would be um, so that that could then be operationalized into sort of triage referrals. Um, so I ran a chi-square analysis and looking at the Kramer's V, you can see that there's a substantive association between gender um, and risk for CSEC victimization. Um, you know, almost 90% of the males were in the uh, low risk category. I will say that um, <laughs> this was a different time in my development, uh, but you know, going back to the cultural considerations of this talk, we only included male and female in our uh, gender <laughs> as we were collecting data. Uh, if you wanna know if I regret that, yes, I do. Um, I regret that, get, regret that a lot. <clears throat> so, but unfortunately that's what we're left with here. Um, the next thing I wanted to do was examine some con convergent validity. And so, you know, if you're in a high risk group for CSAC victimization, that level of risk, right, should be associated with other variables um, that are, th that should be theoretically associated with that risk. Um, and we thought that there would be, you know, a theoretical connection between depression and your general um, clinical index, which is a broad index of just sort of mental health distress that's embedded in the CBRS, the Connors Comprehensive Behavior Rating Scales. And so what you were looking at here are um, comparisons and scores between the groups, pre-planned comparisons. These are hedges G. Hedges G is the difference in the mean scores divided by the common standard deviation, um, controlling from the parametric assumption of equivalent groups. So for example, let's just look at, um, if you look at the difference between the low risk and the high risk group, it says negative 0.94. That's because the low risk score was then subtracted, the high risk score was subtracted from the low risk score. And the information you're getting is the difference in scores on our index of risk, the star, was about almost an entire standard deviation. 0.94% uh, of the standard deviation difference in the scores there. And so what we showed was that when we're comparing the low and the high risk groups, even the low with the moderate risk groups, there's substantial differences in what these folks are uh, reporting on with regard to their experience of depression and mental distress more broadly. Um, I also, uh, we also included in our protocol the um, attributions and perceptions, the, sorry, the children's attributions and perceptions scale, which is an index of um, attributions and perceptions that are widely known to be held by children who are the victims of sexual abuse more broadly. Um, and what we, what we found was the folks who were being identified at high risk for CSEC uh, victimization reported that they felt different than other peers their age. And they felt a lot more different than other peers their age than the moderate risk and the low risk groups. Uh, the high risk group was also much more likely to attribute negative events in their lives to themselves to take on that blame. Okay, so what we're seeing is our scores in our risk protocol are, are associated with, with other uh, variables that should be theoretically associated. So this is establishing convergent uh, validity. Uh, here's our high, our high risk, our moderate risk, and our low risk groups. And I'll say anyone who's listening right now, and you know, if you're thinking about establishing using whatever risk tool you decide to use, you can always, I'm going to flip back up here real quick. If referring agencies are telling you an exact percentage of folks that they can take on in terms of a referral for a further interview about risk or to get treatment as a CSEC uh, survivor. And they say to you, for example, we can, you, how many people come to your agency? And you say a thousand. And they, they say, okay, we can take 5% of that. You can always set cutoffs for your identification of risk to meet the administrative demand and not necessarily 
um, something that's kind of based more on the population that you have um, in, in theory, right? And so we got lucky in that we found out there are referring agencies in DC, they could take almost 20% of uh, the folks who got uh, arrested each year. And so we gave, we would refer out our moderate and our high risk groups. Um, but if they weren't able to do that, all I would have done actually is I would have just adjusted our cutoff score so that the group that can be manageably referred um, is identified as the high risk group. So then high risk becomes your risk relative to your peers, but also in the context of the administrative demands of the agencies, or the, you know, the, the environment of agencies in, in which you work. Um, and so our moderate risk group would was, was identified as folks with kind of a, a less immediate need for mental health intervention. Um, they would get a, a less intrusive, a less costly intervention. Um, wherever their agency was, they would get sort of a CSEC information session, uh, for example, low, low intrusion stuff. Our high risk group got mental health treatment. They were referred out to CSEC specific agencies, which were there, there were very few in DC. And they also got referred to something called in DC called the multidisciplinary um, team. Um, and there was sort of this three stage process, right? So we would determine if the use is, was engaged in mental health services or not. And if not, get them engaged with a provider. Um, and then they would be uh, referred to this multidisciplinary team that met monthly did case reviews and developed individualized multidisciplinary intervention plans. And it was a great, it's a great group and it, can, it included representatives from all the major agencies um, in Washington, DC, kind of, you know, banding together and uh, pooling resources, pooling intellectual uh, knowledge and um, expertise and experience and uh, providing these kids with um, individualized um, interventions. Um, and now I should say in DC, uh, before I go on to that, DC now has um, a CSEC specific court the subsumed in the family court. And a lot of um, jurisdictions where they've moved to decriminalize being a survivor of CSEC, they've also started to establish these CSEC specific courts. I did consultation um, at the Dream Court in LA that they have in the Superior Court in, um, in Los Angeles. They have one established in Washington, DC. I know there's other places um, establishing their CSEC specific courts um, um, as well. And so that would be just to make clear, for example, in the DC, uh, the CSEC specific court, it's not a, it's not a criminal um, adjudication. It is not an overly formal setting. Judges you know, come down and talk with, with uh, victims, survivors, one-on-one, um, -on -one. and uh, yeah, it's not certainly not an adversarial uh, process um, in that court. Okay, so moving towards uh, improving how we identify CSEC survivors. Um, so I've begun work with uh, the wonderful and the uh, brilliant pioneer, um, uh, Dr. Celia Williamson at the University of Toledo. And um, we have embarked upon, uh, you know, just in, improving uh, the fidelity of our, of our methods. Um, we've, we would like, as I was developing in, at DC courts, we want something that's quick, non-intrusive, quantitative. Um, but we also wanted to, um, I, <laughs> wrestling with all of, all of that inter-rater reliability and the code books and, and all the things that came with the STAR, which was uh, working, I think, very well, we wanted uh, to move to a self-report form so that we could, we could drop um, that, um, that uh, you know procedural piece um, that that was um, time consuming and sometimes difficult. The other thing is that when I was in DC, um, I kept saying we've got to sit down with survivors. We must sit down with them and get information from them about what we should be asking kids. 
you know? And so that's what we did. We grabbed, you know, items from the star, items from the intervene, items from the intersect, all those extant screening tools out there, and also developed um, uh, items, uh, you know, from literature reviews. And we sat down focus groups of CSEC survivors, and we asked them, hey, what do you think about these questions? What did, how, you know, are they worded wrong? How would you reword them? What should we be asking kids and adolescents who might be at risk? What do you think is going to get us um, that information uh, that we want without asking somebody um, disclose, to disclose? So we started with, with focus groups, um, and we developed a 15-item um, index of, res of risk for CSAC victimization, uh, which I will refer to as the focus. The focus is subsumed already in a large-scale uh, intervention model that Dr. Williamson um, has developed and has had um, children and adolescents involved in for many years now. Um, uh, so really, this is really um, kind of working backwards, right? She had the intervention, and now we're getting a screening tool to, to get kids there. Um, so we set up an ordinal um, self-report. Um, and then, you know, the, the first thing that I did with, with the data after we started to um, pilot it uh, is something that I hadn't done in DC um, and I, and I kind of regret. And that is that um, I developed this sort of what's referred to as a, a non-parametric um, sanity test where um, the focus is on examining the functional form between the item response and the scale score using rest as a proxy um, to see if it follows this sort of you know, monotone increasing or monotone decreasing um, function. So if you look, if let's just talk for a second. So here, here's how it was scored. Um, our, 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 all our items were ordinal. Zero, one, two, three, or four um, is what um, the children and adolescents could um, endorse. Let's just look at the score of zero. Score of zero okay, is the line that's at the top that goes from the top left and, and has, you know, a monotone decreasing function in that relationship between the scale and the item response, right? And so this is what this means. So look down at the bottom uh, below that line where it says zero. So what that means is that if the average score on all the other items and this is for item one. So this is just the plot of item one. If all this, if the scores on all the item, other items for this individual were zero, what's the probability of also endorsing zero for this item? And it makes sense, right? If, if zero was the average for all the other items, very high probability of endorsing zero on this item. And then that probability goes down, right? And it should be if all if you're if you're reporting a score of zero on all the other items, there should be a very low probability of you in, endorsing somewhere between you know a three or a four, right? And so that's why it's you know monotone decreasing. The other scores, right, one, two, three, and four, were not um, monotone increasing or decreasing. And so what that tells us is that we have a dichotomous scale. Um, in all the other items, um, our uh, characteristic curve plots looked very similar. And so what that was telling us is maybe risk is more um, di dichotomous um, than nuanced order hall. Okay. <laughs> uh, so let's see. And so let's just talk broadly uh, about what where are we getting the most information um, from our items. So from the intersect, it's they, they reported that, um, Salisbury reported that we're getting the most information from child protective service involvement, um, gender, females more at risk than, than males, runaway behaviors, um, their current living situation, right? If they're living with someone who's not a family member or maybe just a friend or someone uh, they identify as a partner. Um, um, in terms of the star, we were getting the most information about risk um, as conceptualized here 
and discrimination um, statistics, how well an item discriminates between individuals with different levels of CSAC risk. And the most information we were getting um, in DC from the STAR was running away behaviors, um, including the both frequency of running away from the home and the duration that children or adolescents were absent from the home. Um, um, in terms of uh, the focus, when we were um, develop, gathering data in, in Ohio, uh, the most information we were getting was from an item about whether that item we were talking about that I used in DC um, from the children's attributions and perception scale, we reformulated that, that item. Um, so the degree to which an individual feels older than peers that are the same age was giving us the most information about risk, uh, risk for CSEC um, uh, survivorship. If you're being, feel like you're being treated older than other kids your age, that was an, a strong indicator of risk among um, adolescents and ch children and adolescents in Ohio. Um, also, if your friends are engaging in behavior uh, that's typically not approved by adults, that was a, an item that was good at discriminating between individuals with high and low levels of risk and utility and security. So um, our list included things like, you know, um, uh, inconsistent access to um, electricity and all those kinds of things. Um, and then even not, not consumption, but just thinking about drugs or alcohol in the past month. Um, place of residence at the time of, of the interview, um, having ever been in foster care, also items we're getting a lot of information from. Uh, and I'm going to have to, I'm opening up my slideshow in another page because I can't actually, because of all the things on Zoom, I can't see my titles here. So I'm going to move to, sorry about that, where I can see, actually see my, my titles. All right. Um, okay. Previous charge of, of solicitation um, and with whom someone resides. These are all items that are, are giving us a lot of information about um, CSEC. Um, risk. Okay. Um, and that was with a, oh, this was with the, with the star in, um, in DC. Okay. And so now we're going to look at difficulty um, estimates, and that is how much latent trade do you need for the probability of uh, endorsing an item being at about 50%. Um, and so running away from home in the past month um, was an item that uh, required a, a high level of, of risk. Um, if you feel as though your parent or guardian, guardian is unable to keep you safe, that also uh, required a high level of, of risk to endorse. And utility and security, which we know also is very good at discriminating among individuals with different, different levels of risk. Um, and whether or not someone actually consumed alcohol in the past month. Those were all the items that um, required a high, the highest level of, of risk um, for folks to endorse. Okay, so um, the next thing I wanna talk about a little bit is, is measurement um, invariance. Now, when, I, when we piloted the study in, in Ohio with the, the kids and adolescents in Ohio, um, we had a lot of different gender identities um, to, to choose from. And we also had an open-ended question, you know, an open-ended response option. You know, to, if we didn't uh, describe um, a, a gender identity that someone identifies with, they could, they could write it in. Over 90% over 90 was just male, male or female. I don't know what to, to make of that. I find... Um, it's, uh, but at any rate, that's what we had. I examined gender invariance of all the, all the items on the focus. Um, and we found that only one or two um, were, were not gender um, in, invariant. Um, but I think gender in uh, different area, there are other areas to continue to examine where measurement um, there might be, uh, you know, where we need to establish measurement invariance. One thing that's coming up is that in all of these studies, right, in a DC courts, 
and now in Ohio, which we developed through social service agencies, is that we're kind of piloting these uh, protocols in agencies where we know there's a high level of risk. So we need to start piloting these protocols in places that include sort of uh, folks in the, more in the general population, folks who probably or might not be at risk, you know, maybe public school settings, which include a mix of folks with who are at risk and, and who are not at risk. We don't really know how well these scores are going to work um, or how they compare to folks in, in, in the general um, population. So we need to expand um, the populations where we're studying these scores, and that would open the door to more examining examinations of measurement and variance across various populations. Um, I put age as a question mark here. Uh, believe it or not, um, you know, a, a way to establish discriminant validity um, of CSEC risk screening tools is to include age. Yes, convert, not convergent validity, discriminant validity, in that uh, theoretically age is actually not um, associated uh, with risk for CSEC victimization. Um, and in fact, looking at the, the scores that the STAR produced in DC um, adolescents who were court involved in DC and the FOCUS scores who were uh, adolescents and children adolescents who were involved in social service agencies in Ohio, age was almost totally unassociated um, with, with, with risk. Um, I, age is yet to, examining measurement and variance across age groups has, has yet to be done though. Okay. All right. Okay, so um, in summary, uh, you know, the federal government uh, set down uh, uh, some, some mandates and some comprehensive um, legislation, which then trickled down to states and Washington, D.C., not a state, pretend state, and, uh, and then to the agencies who are, who are there working to identify folks who are at risk of CSEC, uh, victimizations, folks who were um, identified survivors of CSEC, and to provide them with um, appropriate um, um, interventions. And so that sort of was the, the beginning of construct uh, development um, in this area. And where we can expand is, I think that we need to um, continue down the focus group route um, I know we've done a round of, of focus groups and kind of reformulated items, but uh, continuing to work with the children and adolescents who are trafficked to get the language right around these items and to tell us about um, areas of risk that we haven't considered, um, that's where real item refinement um, is going to happen. We also need to expand research, um, as I said, into uh, populations that aren't as risk at, as at risk and start examining um, scores um, and compare scores with with uh, from folks who are uh, you know involved in agencies that are indicative of risk like social service agencies and, and folks who are court involved. Um, okay, and so I'm going to leave it open now for uh, for some some questions and, and discussion. And I'm going, I'm supposed to do this. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, we'll leave that QR COPA open for anybody to scan. And uh, thank you so much, uh, James, Dr. Andretta. Uh, this is it's just eye-opening how much has gone into this. And also, you know, just the understanding the history of the, the urgency and federal discussion of, you know, how to address a, just such a critical, critical issue. Um, and so thank you for all your contributions in this area. Uh, for those of you that do have uh, questions, you can enter them into the Q&A Q &A box. Um, in the chat is the link that you can click if you are pursuing APA continuing education credits, or you can scroll up as well for the, um, for the medical education credits. The QR code here will also get you access to that same APA CEU link survey. Um, the we have we have checked the links. Uh, they are they are indeed working. They are indeed active. Um, so please, my recommendation would be to to bookmark it on the side uh, for opening it up in another web browser or so if it is not working for you at the moment. 
Um, so, so one question that somebody had was, do curiosity of if your measures account for online exploitation by parents, other adults, older youth, or peers? For example, parent-child accounts on TikTok, where the parents marketing and exploiting their children online. Oh my gosh. What a great question. I'm actually, I hope you don't mind. I'm going to write down, I'm going to write that down because I, I think actually at this stage, um, social media involvement, right? There could be an, an item there, right? And um, and I hadn't thought about, yeah, parent participation. That's interesting. Because, right, because has a parent posted a video of you is a lot different than have you posted a video of yourself or has a friend post? So that's really interesting. Um, so we have not delved into those items, but this is exactly, see, because I'm an old man, right? You know, <laughs> this is exactly why we need to bring these items um, to other folks and to, to um, you know, the, the survivors themselves because we get stuff like this. I'm going to write that down. I can't tell you how much I appreciate that. I think that's great and I'm going to pursue it. <laughs> but no, it's not, it's not in any of these screening protocols that I'm aware of. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, what uh, I'd love to hear so far. I mean, you've mentioned some of the some of the challenges, or in retrospect, things that you would do differently. What have been particularly some of the most une unexpected challenges in developing any kind of assessment measure in this area? Um, yeah, I mean, I in terms of um, the the unexpected challenges, um, that's a good question. Um, the, the unknowns it's, you know, and I, I think there, there's, there, there are just a lot of, there's a lot of obstacles in terms of, you know, being able to collect the data in, in at-risk, um, groups. Um, I, I think the biggest, um, obstacle, um, that we've, that we've met so far, right, is not, not, not being able to ask them to disclose, <laughs> <laughs> and I and I I didn't know that kind of um, going in. I've already mentioned that, so that's nothing new. And and there's no added value. I apologize. Yeah, um, sure. Yeah, somebody's adding in this uh, this this context here about TikTok parents often monet monetizing their children, knowing the comments, likes, and advantage of others sexualizing their child, even if it's not their explicit purpose. Um, so again, like the, even the explicit versus implicit purpose here, complicating things all the further. Yeah, you know, that's it. That's interesting. Yeah, because right, that, that expands what a C sex survivor is, you know, conceptually, right? Because this isn't you, you, that that those children who are in those videos might never um yeah, they're exposed in some way that's that's sexual, uh, that didn't happen to them. Well, it happened to them directly. That's interesting. I gotta do a lot of thinking about this. I'm, I'm these questions are great. <laughs> uh did, did anyone in focus groups express concerns about being referred out to another agency who then explicitly asks about CSEC experiences? This person adds, I'm concerned it would it would denormalize the experience further and be more uncomfortable for children to disclose. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's an obstacle we face um, all the time. Uh, you know, th this group, not only did they have to deal with that, they've had to deal with just decriminalization. You know, Washington, D.C., as I said, they didn't decriminalize being a survivor until 2018. So that that's always a concern over pathologizing um, and um, yeah, getting getting referred referred out and it's it's it, it is it, it's it's a difficult um, it's a difficult subject matter in, in, in that in that regard. Um, and um, it's certainly, um, something I think that uh, we, we should all have um, in, in our calculus. Mm -hmm. uh, can you can you talk uh, some about how to identify tattoos indicative of branding? Yeah, you know what? Thanks for asking that. And I, I put up the items that are working. Tattoo didn't work at all. Tattoo is not. Tattoos have not um, yielded discrimination or difficulty or threshold parameters, however you want to word it. Um, that were substantive. And so um, when I left DC courts and now, you know, working with the Ohio group, I, um, you know, we, we haven't had a tattoo in our, in the, in the focus. Um, and I, I don't see right now, I don't have an indication of bringing it back, bringing it back in. 
um, just because it just hasn't hasn't done well, hasn't been piloted well yet. We have uh, we have a couple people that are now asking about if the is this can they utilize the star measuring tool at their agencies? Is it available for download? Is it available for sharing? At the so here's where I have to be careful with my words. Mm -hmm. DC Courts has copyrighted that, and so you have to contact DC Courts about that. I can tell you that the focus that I'm working on um, with the folks in, in Ohio, our entire purpose is for this to be open open sourced. And you know, we're hoping to have it in hospital screenings at emergency departments and public schools and social service agencies. Um, and there's no effort on any of our behalves to have this you know, copyrighted and, and, and unavailable. So if you contact me um, through my website, which you can find on the slides, um, I, I'm sure I can talk with, with Dr. Williamson. I'm sure we're, we're hoping to have our first publication out on it um, soon enough. And I know in the, um, the supplemental um, uh, materials, we're going to have it right there. But I, I'm sure we'd be able to share it with you. Yeah, but the star is copyrighted. DC Courts wanted to copyright it. Um, I'll just leave it at that. Fair enough. Yeah, <laughs> I, I imagine related to that, or if perhaps people can contact you, question of any chance of using your screening tool for a research project in states like New Mexico, especially children from diverse communities. I, I you know, this is so funny. CSEC has, CSEC fell on my lap when I didn't expect it. And then it fell on my lap again when I didn't expect it. And now I've embraced it. Uh, I, I would just, you, you could not make me a happier person by reaching out and saying, hey, I want to collaborate um, and, and work on a project on this. You know, some of these screening protocols are brief and they can be integrated um, into whatever agency or research protocol you're, you're working on. And gosh, that would, nothing would make me more happy than that, than a, a collaboration. <clears throat> I'd be honored. I, so thank you for asking. Excellent. Please, contact me. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a study of results of uh, the, the, the difference between children being exploited by religious families, for example, Ruby Frankie and Jody Hildenbrandt, versus those that are exploited due to other issues like family issues, poverty, or grooming? Yeah, so I guess for me, um, in, in my line of inquiry, <laughs> Dr. Williamson would be able to answer your question in terms of um, uh, kind of like a, a you know, emotion, uh, you know, distress outcomes or those kinds of, you know, whatever the outcome is. For me, my interest is what's your level of risk? Um, and I have wondered about, um, you know, religiosity or, uh, you know, or religion. It, it, is it possible that, you know, it, it's some kind of item of, of indicator of risk? I hope it doesn't come to that. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's how I would conceptualize it. What item would would yield from that information from the question you asked? What how would that translate into an item that would be an indicator of risk? That's that's what I work on. Um, you know, doc, but reach out to Dr. Williamson. She's always very communicative. Um, and she has been dealing, she has been working in intervention in this group for a long time and published books and all those kinds of things. So she would she'd know the answer to that. Excellent. We are at the top of the hour. So um, yeah, Dr. Andretta, James, uh, thank you so much. Um, of course, rewinding back, thank you so much for the work that you do in this area, your contributions here, your forthcomingness of the development of all, all of this, and just uh, a better understanding for us of ways to identify um, and understand a really critical issue, child sexual exploitation. Um, so thank you so much for all of your efforts related to this. It is much appreciated. Oh, and, that so wraps, yeah. and that wraps up this week's uh, Law and Mental Health series. We hope to see you next week when uh, Dr. Anna Feynman will be discussing psycholegal considerations around the incel movement. Uh, we hope to see you then for another great discussion of issues in behavioral health and the law. Until next time.